There's a significant amount of information, significant amount of data um, that our systems collect, um, and obviously within the Navy intelligence community, information is critical, it is important, it is our lifeblood, it is what we do, so um, our ability to ensure that it is out there and it has provided the appropriate confidentiality, integrity, availability is important to us, but we are also plagued by some of the same challenges every other public and private sector organization is when we talk about resources, the abilities to ensure that data is protected as it needs to. So from a risk management perspective, we really are focusing a lot now on how can we, what we call holistic risk management, truly automate risk authorization type related decisions or at least influence them in a more automated manner. One of our biggest challenges now are the, is the amount of data calls that we're getting internally within NOAA, um, within the Department of Commerce and from outside agencies and how can we leverage all this dispersed data that we have everywhere in several systems and automate it and get it on a single pane of glass. Um, we're, we're starting to look at that right now. Um, leverage that as we move to an RMF to continuously monitor and assess our systems. I mean, some of the times we looked at how to do automatic response back based on incidents. Now you have to be very careful about that. And we're, we're looking at it in terms of how, how often does this incident occur and what is the standard response? Because what you don't want to be able to do is the enemy can actually come back and cause us to have a standard response, which is what we don't want. Mm -hmm. So we've been back and forth with what intelligence systems can we actually use this with, and we have some of those when we get to uh, other sensor data as well as what sensor data you're coming in. For instance, IoT data is very messy to us sometimes as to when it comes in, as to what we want to do based on that data. Is it a threat data? Is it not a threat data? Is it an incident occurring out in the field that we don't know about? And so we're looking at it in terms of what machine learning capabilities can we actually apply to say, is this really a building incident based upon other outside source information? intelligence information, as well as things that are going on in all the bases. And you got to remember, the Air Force is a global enterprise that has 250 sites across the world. So we bring in lots of data all the time. We want to look across the enterprise and say, is this base being somewhat attacked, attacked in quotes, as opposed to its other base? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what we are being able uh, to be very successful at is we know that procedurally, there's just certain things that are going to happen in the context of responding to an event to determine if it's an incident. And that may be simply that you're aware of an event, you may perform some level of forensics uh, capturing just to get the event-related data. Um, you, you know that your SOC may create a ticket to start capturing that information to document throughout the incident report. Um, and then you also want to know immediately, if nothing else from a senior leader perspective, where else are we being impacted by this event. So today we automate all of that. Uh, with respect to a good portion of our enterprise to where we identify an event, we have a system that captures the information, does that forensics capture automatically, takes that file or whatever the thing is and searches the entire network to see if it's resident anywhere else. So it helps us quickly identify scope, impact, all those things, not only give that great awareness, but then to really figure out what is it that we're dealing with now. How do we need to appropriately respond? When we stood up the eSocket, the typical analyst who's going through lines and lines and lines and lines of SIM data, as we started to automate that, we took those, that staff and gave them a different skill set and said, okay, as the data starts to come in and gets correlated, analyze it at that level and then set severity. So while the staff didn't go down, we shifted their direction in from incident response to communications. So it becomes you're not losing staff, but what you're doing is you're just retraining them to do other things for you in a more smart and intelligent manner. And there's a lot of great things that the tools can do, but what we really care about with the tools is the data they produce, not the tools themselves. So again, people are very critical in that aspect, so anywhere where we can take level of effort associated with those kind of regular tasks that the tools can do a really good job at, we really want the tools to focus on that. Uh, something was mentioned in the earlier panel, um, you know, ultimately, technology is the enabler. So, again, we still want to rely on the people, but how do we make the people's jobs a lot more efficient and effective, and we do that through technology. Mm -hmm. What comes first is really the mission. And if we have a clear understanding of the mission and the requirements associated with that, then we understand what is the appropriate solution to it. And it may or may not be technology, but in this case, for us, for the most time, it is. Um, so when we start looking at that, we may not necessarily look at the cloud first as the option or the solution, <laughs> But um, in a lot of areas, we are seeing that. So again, really kind of 
leaning more specific into your question, today we understand that there are certain systems that will remain legacy and they need to remain kind of in their legacy mode, but then what are those things that we can transition and understand the requirements of Navy intelligence to ensure we can put out timely, relevant maritime intelligence information. Um, we're ensuring that there are those reliable comms, right? That there is that secure environment that can ensure the integrity we need, that the appropriate information is getting to the right decision makers in its most integral form. Um, so we are looking at things as well and utilizing tactical clouds. Um, most areas we're basically taking some of our legacy capabilities and kind of segmenting them out to say what are the things that will best support and operate within a cloud environment. Um, so that kind of comes into maybe looking at a different perspective and what used to be this one solution now uh, then is kind of looked at as something a little different now, but ultimately we're still providing the same capability to the warfighter at the end of the day through our collective intelligence. NOAA is a, a different agency. We provide information for everyone. We provide you know, weather data, uh, uh, current data, all kinds of things that we need to, to get out to the public, but at the same time we have to pr protect the systems that is, that is generating that data. So it is a challenge. We're working through that now. That word that I use is perspective. Um, you know, it's kind of common we identify that there are definitely shortages with specific kind of skill sets in this area within the cyber arena. But if you change your perspective a little bit, it's the reality is what is it that we want out of this cyber professional? You can take a lot of organizations and depending on them truly understanding and executing their role, my office, I have a very broad scope of responsibility off of a very broad and massive scope of a community. But day to day, I really focus more on policy and governance. And I have lots of other organizations that execute the more technical aspects of cybersecurity. So at the end of the day, if I'm looking for a cyber professional, I'm looking for someone that can do really good things in the areas of business process engineering, continuous process improvement, understanding policy and how we facilitate the development, coordination, review, and dissemination of those types of things. Um, but when we do really focus on kind of what the broader realm of society looks at as cyber is this really kind of sexy hacking type thing, um, ultimately what you get to is, yep, yeah, it's a technical person, but the reality is you want someone that has this kind of really more analytical mindset, paranoia, questions everything. And if you really charge and come from that perspective, you'll identify that you don't really have to look at the folks that have the strong technical backgrounds anymore. You can look at the folks that have those skills. Yes, we notice there's a shortage of skills. I mean, we've been uh, kind of doing on a program of how do I actually recruit more people. We've been doing STEM programs. We've been doing all sorts of issues to start, start younger to get people into uh, the capabilities and understanding what we really want from a, from a cyber professional and how to do this better. We, we have hackathons at the lower level. We actually do this at some of our, our, our uh, uh, conferences now just to support bringing the high school kids and bringing the college kids just to understand what, what the Air Force is doing in terms of cybersecurity and everything else. So we're trying to do a massive campaign, really, to say we need some people. Disruptive technology, right, this thing that really kind of breaks the norm of what we used to and the way you know, we kind of really do business. You know, if you really kind of decipher that and remove out all the seaweed and the white noise, what you get to is just it's another technology solution that we probably haven't seen before or seen it in a different way. Uh, but at the end of the day, right, we have truly established a lot of kind of basic cyber hygiene type principles that are really, in my mind, portable to no matter what the solution is, right? So what we have to really do is kind of still ensure that we're paying attention to those, but then really keep an awareness and understanding or gain an understanding of how do these technologies need to work and how do we then evolve the way we kind of do current business today to say what are the missing gaps with respect to how we do security in those areas. The concept is that we're mission first. So everything is based upon mission. Now technology by itself is cool, but unless it supports the mission, it's not going to help us. So when we look at the mission and we look at what technology we want to incorporate in it, that's what we look for. What is the way we get more effective? Because we've talked about you know neural nets and other things as well, and then that's really cool stuff. However, the question is how can that be best applied to meet the mission requirements? And then, you know, there's always a person that's usually involved in the loop, but sometimes we're getting to the point now where the drones and everything else are automated to a certain extent, as well as, you know, doing some identification and everything else, and that supports mission, that's fine. And that's the way we have to play technology into the, into the environment. There's a lot of technology that's been talked about today, and I think the one thing that was kind of overlooked, and, and it's my philosophy going forward, we need to stop bolting on cybersecurity at the end of these development cycles. We need to bake it in at the beginning. And I think that's missed 
a lot. We need this technology, we need to be mobile, we need to be this, but we need to secure that prior to the deployment and not at the last second where we're going, oh God, now we got to comply with this and now how do we fix it? We need to start the thought process of cybersecurity be, should be included at the beginning, not at the end.